Hello, this is Angela with Parco's Permaculture. It's a rainy, blustery day here again in Portland, Oregon, my favorite kind of weather. We've had a high wind warning, so this is the second day in a row that our little farm stand is closed. Uh, there have just been a ton of big branches dropping around the neighborhood. I had to run my dad on an errand earlier and there were just limbs down all over Portland. So figure for safety's sake, we'll keep the farm stand closed. I wanna say thank you to all the folks who've come out and patronized our farm stand. Um, Ruth is really well on her way to be able to start her poultry project for 2022. She wants to raise turkeys and increase our flock of ducks and chickens. So hopefully, fingers crossed, that all comes to fruition, but she's off to a really good start. So thank you to everybody who um, has, is helping make that possible. So today I wanna to talk about an issue that I have seen posted three, four, five times a day in goodness, like every kind of homesteading self-sufficiency um, group that I'm in on social media. It is a hot topic. And so I want to talk about how can we view this issue through a permaculture lens? That's how I like to view all issues. So the issue for today is what are we to do about the supply chain problem, particularly here in America? But there are good things in this video for those of you who live in other places as well. After all, we have a global economy, so we are all connected on some level and this impacts all of us on some level. So we'll see as I get going, this video may be broken up into two sections, um, depends on how long it is, but my hope is to talk about three different areas. First is, why are we in the situation that we're in now? Two is, what are the kind of structural issues that have made us have a global distribution system that is so lacking in resilience. And number three is, what are some permaculture solutions, maybe for the whole distribution system itself, but also that individual families can kind of focus on and undertake as we face supply chain issues going on for several months and potentially even years. Let me start with a little caveat here that I am not an expert on economics. I am an avid hobbyist of economics because I feel that understanding distribution systems, understanding global and local economies is crucial to designing good permaculture, to designing resilient uh, communities of people. But I am not an expert. Obviously, my expertise is plants. But it's something that I'm really interested in and read a lot about. I want to make sure that you all know down in the description, I have linked to several sources that I have used for this video as research. So you're welcome to check those out at your leisure. Any of the statistics that I'm quoting will be from those resources down below. So as we dive into the supply chain, uh, shortage crisis that we're in right now, I want us to be really careful that we don't neglect to discuss the very real um, exacerbation to this problem, which is a certain kind of rhetoric coming from a certain corner of our uh, population, from a certain segment of the media, and from folks with a vested interest in driving up fear and fomenting anxiety in uh, American society, right? A certain prepper mentality that says we need to hoard our resources because everything is falling apart and we're coming to the end of civilization, or um, you know, a certain segment of society that basically says you, you know, it's every man for himself, it's every person for themselves, and. And you need to um, get as much as you can as quickly as you can because everything's going to hell. That's a really dangerous and um, troublesome rhetoric that is being regurgitated everywhere. And it only makes the crisis that we're in much worse. So I'll talk about that more later, but let's not do that. Let's, we're not gonna do that in this video. And I hope that you're conscious of when you're talking about this issue um, with friends and family, that you're not kind of driving up folks' fears and anxieties, but instead working towards solutions. So at the beginning, beginning of the pandemic and as the pandemic has progressed, what we've seen is a huge uptick in home sales, driven partially by incredibly low interest rates, um, but also a number of other factors. We've also seen a dramatic uptick in automobile sales and in home repair and renovations, which use raw supplies, right? Which we use materials and employ contractors. 
the sales and increase in all of these areas, home sales, car sales, and home renovation, all dramatically outpaced the anticipated increase. So what we found was that um, the market was not prepared for how quickly we saw all of those things shoot up in demand and therefore shoot up in price. We ended up with a supply and demand issue. The demand really outpaced the supply far more quickly than economic experts had envisioned. So what I've seen neglected in most of these conversations and kind of homestead prepper groups is the people power, the worker power issue. 3% of the entire American workforce took early retirement last year. That is a huge, unprecedented number of people that just said, now we're done, we're gonna retire, bye. Those were skilled people uh, at the end of their career with decades of experience and um, you know, losing them at such a high rate has really cost us. 700,000 people in America have died of COVID in less than two years. Five million people around the world have died of COVID in less than two years. Most of those people were workers and in some way contributed to the economy, either as producers or consumers. We cannot in any way neglect the significant impact of losing five million people off the face of the planet who should not have died uh, when we're talking about a worker shortage and a distribution shortage. Millions and millions of the 300 million people who got COVID are facing long haul complications, health issues, disability, and a slow recovery. They have all, most all, they have all had to take time off of work. Folks have had to take time off of work just to quarantine. This massive, uh, increase in folks needing to take sick leave and take disability has had a significant impact on production. We've seen a reduction in what's called people movement, basically immigration short term and long term in the pandemic. And that's been um, incredibly damaging to our economic system. Short term migrant labor has been dramatically reduced as we have limited crossing the border during COVID and as we've seen immigrant laborers uh, become ill and die. We've also seen a dramatic reduction in long term immigration. All of those factors pool together to really impact our workforce, particularly for low cost goods and services. Let's not forget as well, millions of American women quit their jobs during the pandemic in order to deal with crisis childcare situations that have arisen for pretty much every family that has kids. All of these factors have pooled together and contributed to a huge labor shortage in America. And when you don't have workers to produce the goods that you need or to distribute the goods that you've imported, you have a distribution problem. So the last thing we're seeing is a supply issue that has been exploited by the market, has been exploited by corporations who take the supply and demand issue and let it drive up prices astronomically in many, many sectors of our economies. For example, the cost of lumber pre-pandemic, you're building a brand new construction house. You could expect to spend $7,000 on the lumber toward the cost of your construction. In early 2021, you could expect to spend $27,000 just on the lumber uh, for the cost of construction of your house. That's not the labor, that's not any other supplies, $27,000 just for lumber. You're looking at a huge increase that is driven up by corporations who are using our economic system to their advantage. So what are some of the weaknesses inherent in the system that have really caused our distribution model to lack resilience. Well, firstly, is that we fail to recognize that the supply chain is not made up of products and goods. It is made up of people. People are impacted by COVID. Our supply chain was utterly unprepared for a dramatic event which caused so many people to need to step away from the workforce. All those people I mentioned above, millions of people have had to step away from the workforce or have died. And um, that has had a dramatic impact. Our distribution system is heavily reliant on folks being available right now to take care of the goods and services and their shipping that is necessary for our economy to thrive. That's not resilient, clearly. I will also say, and I'm sure I'll get some lovely comments down below about it, but this page deals in reality and science and um, 
there is a certain segment of the American population, granted a small segment because more than 76% of eligible Americans have gotten at least one COVID shot, but there's a small and vocal segment that is spewing anti-vaccine rhetoric. Um, those folks are prolonging the pandemic. And the reality is, as I just said, humans are impacted by COVID. The longer the pandemic rages in the United States, the more the humans that work in our distribution and economic systems are impacted, and the longer it will take for us to uh, recover economically. So let's not be fooled here. Folks who are spewing anti-vaccine rhetoric are doing damage to the economy as well as um, promoting a message that costs people their lives. So the next thing that is an inherent weakness in our system is that Americans live in a culture where we have no delayed gratification. We want what we want when we want it. We live in a culture that has lost touch with seasonality. We want things regardless of whether they are in season. We want things without having to wait. We wanna click and we wanna have um, somebody in a big navy blue van working for a terribly exploitive wage, drop it off within 24 hours in a big hunk of plastic packaging. We've been conditioned as consumers to say, you can have what you want right now. Don't worry about the consequences to the environment or to workers. Don't worry about whether what you're buying actually tastes good and is in season or um, whether there was harm done in producing it. You want it, you can have it. Treat yourself. That feeds into the next issue, which is that our distribution system does not deal in stockpiles. There is a very, very short buffer between the demand and the supply. There are not large stockpiles because those are expensive for companies to keep. And those are goods that are just sitting there not making money. So our modern um, way of producing goods trims the budget heavily by having the production barely keep up with the demand. Goods are produced as they are needed and not very far beforehand. And that means when you see a drop in supply of raw materials or an uptick in demand, it means that supply can very quickly uh, not be able to keep pace and you end up with a shortage of goods. In permaculture, we talk about producing a yield and how we really need to be prepared, not in the sense of a prepper, but we need to be prepared and to plan ahead. But the American economic system is about a fast turnaround on profit and not actually about sustainability. The next one is our reliance on fossil fuels. Coal and oil prices, particularly coal prices, have skyrocketed during the pandemic. And that means that lots of businesses and uh, factories that produce the elements that go into making the consumer goods that we purchase have dramatically increased in price as well. Anytime we are relying on fossil fuels, we are not working toward resilience. So as long as our distribution systems are heavily reliant on fossil fuels for the production and the shipping, then um, we're not gonna be resilient. The next barrier to resilience in our global distribution system is that we lack robust local food economies in America. So as we examine why we are in the situation we're in right now, what has led to our current um, global shipping crisis and a crisis that we are likely going to be facing for many months yet to come. And as we look at what weaknesses are inherent in the system that we have built, as we look at how we have prioritized a quick fix and profit over robust, resilient systems that can withstand difficult times, what I see when I look at that, and I hope what you all see too, is that we need permaculture design. Permaculture is not gardening. Permaculture is not about just growing food. It's about creating resilient ways for people to live that don't exploit other humans and that help heal the planet. That includes not only how we grow our food, but also how we produce all our goods and how we distribute them to people around the world. Permaculture is about designing better. It's about building resilient ways of living for all people. Using a system that is so heavily built upon fossil fuels and exploiting human labor does not follow the ethics of permaculture, of earth care, people care, and fair share. Building a system that focuses on a quick profit and a quick turnaround instead of a, a robust network that can withstand the stressors and the crises that humans inevitably will face is not a system that can last. We need permaculture design. 
The initial outbreak of COVID and then the Delta variant spike have shown us that we are highly at risk if future COVID variants prove to be as uh, injurious to human health as the last two big waves. Our system is likely to face another shipping shortage, another crisis of getting goods to consumers if we rely on the same system that we have now. So I hope you will tune back in for part two where I talk about what our family is doing in the face of the shipping crisis, what we've already done in the past to help make our family more resilient, and some things that we're taking on now as we continue to evaluate and improve our design. I also want to talk a little bit about what the system as a whole potentially could do. Again, keeping in mind that I'm not an economist and you know this is an incredibly comp complex topic. I hope that you'll tune back in for that video. Um, I hope that you'll share your comments and thoughts uh, in the bottom about weaknesses that you see in the system because when we look problems straight in the face, we can begin to design for solutions. So when we realistically look at how this system is not working and how it's very fragile and uh, how we've gotten into this crisis that we're in, when we face that head on, we're able to start looking for real solutions. So I'd love to hear your thoughts down in the comments. I'll be back really soon talking about what our family is doing in this current shortage. Thanks.